Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if Honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy is the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family tree, your family tree. Check your genealogy. Find who was who and how who came to be. On your family, 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 family tree. Hello and welcome to the Genealogy Radio Show, the radio show that is keeping you in the loop, which is broadcast from Radio Kirkabashkeen and is also repeat broadcasted on Sunday afternoons. For this week's show, we have me, myself, Owen, alongside uh, Garvin and Alva. And for this week's show, we are going to be looking at the area of the Celtic revival um, and how this was a big influence uh, culturally and socially um, on the island of Ireland, um, particularly in the late 19th century. Um, we'll also look at um, the origins of Celticism and the, the different kinds of um, ways in which there was a Celtic revival, um, not just in Ireland, but in neighbouring countries, um, in Britain, um, Brittany, in France as well. Um, so we're going to start with um, Alva and she can bring us, I suppose, the history of where um, this idea of, of the Celts and the Celtic, particularly the Celtic revival, would have come from. So the Celtic culture would have been, would have originated more than 2,000 years ago. And this would have been first seen in, in Gaulish. So this, these would have been a settlement, a Celtic settlement in Middle, middle of Europe and they would have spread okay. to France and then would have spread to England, Ireland and so on. Um, so the first evidence of Celtic culture in Ireland would have been the 3rd or 4th century and here you have examples of like Ohm writing like between 400 and 700 AD and so on and then with the rise of Christianity they also took some of the Celtic mm -hmm. culture with them like such as stories which can still be heard today. Most of these Celtic stories we kind of mythological, um, kind of magical, kind of fairy tale, folk tale, kind of good luck sort of stories. And such stories would be such as Ashling Angusa, and that's a popular one as well. And this would have been derived from Celtic culture. Um, another one would be Cattle Raid of Cooley. So, um, so for years, uh, this Celtic culture was passed on to different people and so on. But with the spread of with the spread of Christianity and then other kind of people as well, they kind of it gets lost sometimes. Um, and this this was way before the re revival. Um, so. Other than Ireland, you have other languages that would have derived from this Celtic culture, such as Cornish, uh, Breton, and Welsh. And uh, these would have been all connected um, to the Old Irish as well, which would have came from the uh, middle of Europe. Um, so these would have been, in more, when I say recent times, I mean kind of after the 15th, 16th century, they began to become minority languages. Okay. Um, so this was because they had the spread of English and with the spread of English, you know, the people who were speaking English had more power. Mm. And this would have been, I suppose, when a lot of people in those centuries, 15th, 16th centuries, um, expeditions traveling yeah. you know into um i suppose at the time it would have been unexplored parts of the world as well exactly. so that would have further um i suppose helped the english language to grow as well yeah and with that then 
with these languages becoming a minority, you're starting to lose the culture, like the stories, mm-hmm. the way the, the people did things. And these minority languages were soon to kind of frowned upon. The people who spoke at the English people thought they were stubborn and they were backwards okay. and that they didn't want to move on. Mm-hmm. And this this kind of this ruined the the constant flow of the Celtic culture mm-hmm. culture. Um but as I said in recent times then I mean you have the seventeen hundreds, eighteen hundreds music has helped to revive in literature and so on, and sort of re- like waves of um, revival, right even right up until recent times, even to the seven, nine, 1970s to 1990s. Um, you have, I mean, you have Welsh schools opening, you have Irish schools, you know, and, but way before this, there was also a revival, and unless you want to carry on. Yeah, um, so really... Um, one of the key, I suppose, factors which would have brought on the idea of a Celtic revival um, was actually the famine in the 1840s. And with that, you have a huge number of people emigrating to uh, America, the UK, and Canada and Australia. Um, and so with this, I suppose, new dispersion, of, of the Irish across many different continents and countries. Um, there is a desire among uh, middle and upper class um, academics, writers and artists uh, to look upon, particularly in Ireland, the island of Ireland's past and uh, to use the geography, history um, and the cultural aspects of Irish society to promote Ireland. Uh, so some of the prominent um, writers, thinkers and activists such as William Butler Leeds, Douglas Hyde and Lady Augusta Gregory uh, begin to campaign for the preservation and the appreciation of Irish storytelling, uh, Celtic art and at this particular period the rapidly declining Irish language. Um, in 1906, um, D- well Douglas Hyde founds the, I- the Gaelic Lead to promote the Irish language, and by 1906, uh, there are more than 900 branches and over 100,000 members. Uh, so we can see there's a, a huge enthusiasm here for the the Irish language to be resurrected, really. Um, and I suppose through these expressions of Irish culture, uh, this is the point where many Irish people started to realise for their first time that you know Ireland has a history. Um, and and there's a culture very much uh, singular to uh, to Ireland as well. It's sad to think that like if there wasn't a revival, Ireland's history would be kind of be forgotten about. Yeah, it is very true. I mean, if things had gone differently, uh, you know, the famine was such a a huge impact and devastation upon Ireland. But if the famine had never happened, um, it could have Ireland's today could be a very different country. Um, and that the emigration may have been a lot more um, lessened in that regard, certainly. Um, so I suppose these, these particularly these artistic and cultural literary movements um, helped Ireland and helped Irish people to cultivate an identity. Um, and this starts to provide a platform um, for nationalist feelings. And this is something that we, we see... Um, to various extents in, in Scotland as well and, and in Wales. Um, so there's this idea of what's known as um, kind of a pan-Celticism um, identity. Um, and as I say, it the idea of the Celtic revival, it's also very important to note that Celticism as a concept um, it came to strengthen national ideas and identities, particularly in Ireland, but also to other extents in Scotland, Wales, um, parts of England, particularly Cornwall, the Isle of Man, and also Brittany and France as well. Um, and these different strands of Celtic revivalism um, did not really come to develop until the mid-18th century. 
Um, and they didn't always imply a separatist or, I suppose, an independent state as they did in Ireland. Um, and the importance of the Celtic past, um, it really started to dwindle in England uh, as opposed to in the other nations, Wales, Scotland, Ireland. Um, it would have grown in quite a significant way. Um, and many contemporary Celts of the various nations recognize their cultural heritage uh, leading to this idea of a, of a pan-Celticism uh, towards the end of the 19th century. Um, these developments were institutionalized in the Celtic Association which aimed to connect the Celtic nations which was kind of trying to invert the notion of Great Britain and it, it did seem that it would seek to make England peripheral to the Celtic nations. Um, but the view has also developed that Celtic descent uh, was drawn up and I suppose the idea came to prominence uh, at different times in different countries. Um, and you can't equate Celticism uh, with non-Englishness. That cannot be um, viewed in that way. Although uh, at the time in Ireland, uh, there would have been, I suppose, a, a growing anti-Englishness sentiment at that particular period. Um, and historically it can be seen that Celtic ideas have been seen as unifying rather than divisive um, and there is a particular strand of Gothicism uh, which held Celts to be of the same northern European origins um, as that of the Angles and the Saxons as well um, so we can see how I suppose the, the Celtic um, identity um, certainly was across many different nations at the time. Well, historically, I should say. Um, but I think one of the other big factors, the famine, and you also then had the Act of Union 1801, which in Ireland, I think, um, it certainly, I suppose, began um, to bring attention to Celtic ideas because I suppose there was a fear um as Alva was saying, that the Irish were going to lose all this history and this culture um, within the union of the Great uh, of Great Britain. So this is where you start to see these ideas begin to come into um, circulation, really. And um, but in a way, also then you have the British ruling class who start to perceive Celtic ideas. Um, really in a, I suppose, a, with a view that they're kind of sceptical of them. Um, but it also starts to provide um, an excuse for Irish differences. And this is where the difficulty for the British to adequately govern Ireland um, can be seen as well to some extent. Um, so then at the turn of the 20th century, this idea of pan-Celticism um, it seemed that it could present an opportunity for these smaller countries, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, uh, to coalesce and oppose uh, European empires. Though in reality, um, the truth is it was, it was much more of a language-focused um, cultural uh, revivalist movement. Um, and one of the other aspects, of course, is that the origins of Celtic descent uh, was often debated uh, quite vociferously and often to the extent that it overshadowed a union of, of Celtic nations um, and it's probably one of the factors in why um, an idea of, of a pan-Celticism and a union of Celtic nations never quite took off um, to the extent because I suppose um, there was such a strong um, I suppose it, it, it just didn't, because I suppose there was such a strong argument for who, where the, the descent had originally came from. Um, so Garvin is going to continue on, and he's going to look at more into the late 19th century and, and into the 20th century, how the Celtic revival um, prospered, particularly during that period. Yeah, well, uh, particularly in Ireland, uh, in that time frame, um, the uh, Irish literary revival was a hugely influential part of the uh, the cultural revival. 
Um, the, liter the literary movement was associated with a revival of interest in Ireland's Gaelic heritage and the growth of Irish nationalism in the middle of the 19th century. This revival began in the early 1800s with two geographic centres being London and Dublin. They were the two, the two main ones. Um, acclaimed writers like uh, W.B. Yeats founded the Irish Literary Society with T.W. Rawlinstone and Charles Gavin Duffy. Uh, and just for context, this was around the time Douglas Hyde was the first Irish president, so there was a lot of nationalist pride in Ireland at the time. Uh, meanwhile, in the more radical, uh, you know, Arthur Griffin, Ar Arthur Griffith and William Rooney were active in the Irish Fireside Club and went on to, fo to found the Leinster Literary Society. Um, in 1893, Yeats published The Celtic Twilight, a collection of lore and rem reminiscences from the west of Ireland. This book closed with the poem Into the Twilight. It was this book and poem that gave the revival its nickname. Uh, and that year, Hyde, Eugene O'Growney and Owen McNeill founded the Gaelic League, with Hyde becoming its first president. Uh, it was set up to encourage the preservation of Irish culture, its music, dances and language. Uh, also in that year appeared Hyde's uh, The Love Songs of Connacht, which inspired Yeats, uh, John Millington Singe and Lady Gregory. Early on in the revival, we also see founding of the New Ireland uh, Review by Thomas A. Finley in, 19, in 1894. This literary magazine was contributed to by many of the literary greats from this time and it continued publication up until, up until 1911 when it got replaced by Studies, a different paper. Another big development of the Irish literary revival was the prominence of Irish plays. And we can see this through the large amount of famous and highly regarded I Irish plays from this time, such as uh, Playboy of the Western World by James Singe. Um, Yeats, Lady Gregory and Edward Martin published a manifesto for Irish literary theatre in 1897, in which they proclaimed their intention of establishing a national theatre for Ireland. The Irish Literary Theatre was founded by Yeats, Gregory and Martin in 1899 with assistance, assistance from George Moore, and it proposed to give performances in Dublin of Irish plays by Irish authors. The large volume of writers and artists working together can be seen throughout the years of the Irish Literary Revival, and it was a great boon to the movement as a whole. The feminist movement in Ireland uh, also influenced the Literary Revival, as on Easter Sunday 1900, uh, Yeats's friend and muse Maud Gaughan founded Inaidan Aheron, or in English, Daughters of Ireland, uh, which was a revolutionary women's society which included writers Alice Furlong, uh, Annie Egan, uh, Ethna Carberry and Sinead O'Flanagan, uh, and the actors Mara Quinn and Sarah Algood. Uh, Maud Gan herself was born in 1866 and was famous not only for her contributions to stage through her playing uh, actor, uh, characters in many Irish plays, but also for being a suffragette and an Irish revolutionary who fought for home rule. Um, and still standing today and in use is the Abbey Theatre, and that opened uh, right in the middle of this revival uh, in the 27th of December 1904. The newly built Abbey Theatre found uh, great, great success at the time. It staged many soon to be eminent authors, such as William Butler Yeats, uh, George Bernard Shaw, and Lady Gregory. Um, the Irish Revu Review was founded in 1910 by Professor David Houghton uh, of the Royal College of Science for Ireland. The magazine was edited by Thomas McDonough for its first issues, then Par Cullum, then changing its char character utterly from a literary and sociological magazine. Joseph Plunkett edited, edited its final issues as Literary Ireland became involved with the Irish Volunteers and plans for the Easter Rising. Uh, Plunkett published a collection of poems, The Circle and the Sword, the same year. The Irish language remained the dominant language of Irish literature down to the 19th century despite a slow decline which began in the 17th century with the expansion of English power. The latter part of the 19th century saw a rapid place, replacement of Irish by English in the greater part of the country. At the end of the century, however, cultural nationalism displayed a new energy marked by the Gaelic revival which encouraged modern literature in Irish and more generally by the Irish literary revival. The success of the Irish literary revival had huge influence on many authors, playwrights and poets over the following years with huge success throughout the 19th and 20th century, particularly from big names like Oscar Wilde, Bram Stoker, James Joyce, W.B. Yeats, Samuel Beckett, C.S. Lewis, and George Bernard Shaw. And while bilingual writers had great success, such as Flann O'Brien, uh, At Swim, Two Birds, which you know, he wrote in both uh, traditional Irish and English, most of the attention was given to Irish writers who wrote in English and who were at the forefront of the modernist movement and notably James Joyce, who wrote the famous novel Ulysses, 
which is considered one of the most influential books of the century. Um, the playwright Samuel Beckett, in addition to a large amount of prose fiction, wrote a number of important plays, in turn, including Waiting for Godot. Thank you very much, Gavin. Um, so today's show is really an example of how a country such as Ireland um, is able to really reclaim its, I suppose, historical um, and cultural uh, contributions um, to Ireland, but also to many other countries, um, and really how circumstances such as the famine, such as the Act of Union in 1801, uh, really hugely contributed to this idea of an Irish literary revival and a, and a Celtic revival that we see uh, across many strands of, of Irish uh, life. Um, so that is all for this week's uh, radio show. Uh, the show is available for podcast and is also repeated out on Sunday afternoons. So thank you very much for listening to this week's show. Did you ever stop and wonder if you could be related to everyone with your last name? Just think if you're a Lincoln, how you'd be congratulated if Honest Abe were someone you could claim. To clear up any mystery, just check your family history. Genealogy is the name of the game. Now some ancestors you'll find you want to hide. But most of them will fill your heart with pride. Oh, your family tree, your family tree. Check your genealogy, find who was who and how who came to be. Your family, 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 family tree.